Hey, welcome back! Today I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite works of literature. It is Monkey, Arthur Whaley's abridged translation of Wu Qingyin's masterpiece, A Journey to the West. And it stars one of the most fun and beloved characters in all of literature, the amazing Monkey King, or Sun Kong. The original is a hundred chapters long, and quite a challenge for English-speaking readers. It's well worth the challenge, but this is a great place to start if you're unfamiliar with the text. Once you fall in love with this book, you can tackle the whole thing. Arthur Whaley's translation and abridgment has been very popular in English-speaking countries because it is adapted for English speakers. The majority of the original story is a journey from China to India with lots of episodes. And so Arthur Whaley cuts out a whole lot of the episodes on the journey, keeping the beginning and all the setup and the end, but trimming out several stories that happen on the way. He also cuts out a whole lot of the poetry, which is a hugely important cultural aspect of the original, but it's a little bit hard for some English speakers to stop and reflect on the scene in poetry for several pages over and over again. This makes Monkey a great starting place for most English-speaking readers. However, there are some downsides to losing some of those cultural aspects that were in the original. I want to start my discussions of this wonderful book by saying that this book poses a lot of challenges to me. For example, as I'm reading it, I often feel like I've missed something important, or that I missed some layer of symbolism or nuance that would be available to me if I had grown up with this as my cultural heritage. This book is both so wildly funny and crazy, but also rich and complex and deep. It feels like a spiritual allegory combined with slapstick physical comedy, combined with superhero action, simultaneously satirical and ironic, while also being a deep reflection on the nature of spiritual journey. And so I want to preface my discussion here not calling myself an expert in this text as many times as I've read it and as much as I love it, but rather I'm approaching it as a fan, with a fascination with the culture and artistry that it represents, but clear feelings of limitation. I have to point out, first of all, the cultural impact that this novel has had on China. And on all of East Asia, really. It is arguably the most popular literary work in East Asia, and it has been represented and reproduced in a million forms. There are so many different television versions of this, or film versions of this. There are operas that go way, way back in history. There are video games that feature the Monkey King, Sun Wukong. There are cosplay, there are toys, there are a million little children who absolutely idolize this figure as their hero. And as many rich, old classics of literature, it has been retold and repurposed with a different focus and a different emphasis each time, bringing something new over and over again. For example, the fairly recent Monkey King Hero is Back animated adaptation shows Sun Kong as a washed up hero who is saved by the admiration of a very heroic child. And of course a lot of people remember the Japanese adaptation of Goku from Dragon Ball. For a while I was teaching English online to Chinese children and whenever I showed them one of my Sun Wukong toys they would inevitably start jumping around the room doing kung fu moves. It's not hard to find loads and loads of amazing statues and figures and toys of this amazing figure character. They even have Legos! As I said, it's been profoundly important in China. It's one of their four great classic novels. The others being The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Water Margin, or Outlaws of the Marsh, and Dream of the Red Chamber. But of them all, it's probably gotten the most media adaptations. As I mentioned, this story is a religious journey and it explores the interplay and balance between three important religious philosophies of China. Reading this book without at least some understanding of these religious philosophies definitely deters your understanding of what's going on in the text. So I'm going to mention them all briefly here, but I recommend if you're interested in delving deeper into this book, you spend more time researching all three of these. The most important religious philosophy in this book is Buddhism, which does not originate in China, rather it originates in India. And in fact, the journey, in the title Journey to the West, is about San Sang, the monk, who is traveling to India to retrieve the Buddhist scriptures and bring them back to China. This is a vaguely historical event. There was a monk who went to India and brought back scriptures. Now, he probably didn't have a kung fu monkey disciple 
to beat up all the ogres and demons between China and India. That might be an embellishment on the story. But like some other big folk legends that grow up around historical people, this story has a seed of historical fact in it. The central focus of Buddhism is to alleviate the pain of the world, to get away from the suffering that seems so prevalent in life. And that is accomplished by detaching oneself from desire. The more one desires things, the more one will be hurt by those desires. So separating oneself from desire and rising above it, becoming enlightened, ultimately will lead you to be able to step out of the cycle of reincarnation and become a Buddha. These ideas permeate the whole book and are very significant. They're also used sometimes ironically. For example, one of Tripitaka's disciples is Pigsy, who is greedy, gluttonous, lecherous, all the things one would expect who pours himself into his desires. He's sort of the counterpoint. Although he's trying to be a good Buddhist monk, he's a very ironic one. The second religious philosophy is Taoism. Taoism is all about acceptance and passivity, inaction as a path to peace and finding your place, kind of going with the flow. The opposite of this, of course, is aggression and anxiety and ambition. The Taoist monks are also associated with mystic longevity, finding ways to stretch their lives out. The Taoist path is Monkey's first path, as we'll see in chapters 1 through 7. Notice that in spite of the fact that Monkey becomes very powerful in Taoist magic, he becomes very aggressive and ambitious. And instead of going with the flow of things, he shakes everything up and disrupts the order of absolutely everything. See the irony? Finally, there's Confucianism, which isn't a religion exactly. It's more of a philosophy and way of living. And of the three, this one is mentioned the least explicitly throughout the book. Taoism and Buddhism are on every page, sometimes in contest with each other. Confucianism is rather the undercurrent informing everything else that we experience. Confucianism is interested in the value of family and in your role in society. How you relate to all those around you, those above you, those below you. It says that you have a place and you need to do that place to the best of your ability. That means respecting those above you, those older than you, those with more authority than you, your father, your king, and also serving your duty towards those under you, your son, your daughter, your servant, your subject. A good king has responsibility to his subjects, just as those subjects have responsibility to their king. Confucianism also emphasizes piety, or good religious practice. There's also the emphasis on education and the importance of study and learning. Someone who embraces Confucianist values will be very focused on their education, both in reading the great Confucianist texts, as well as becoming more artistic and more literate. I'd like to talk more about the education system in China as we go forward in this book. Sometimes there appears, at least, to be tension between some of these philosophies. And it's an idea I'd like to explore as we go forward. As I already mentioned, there is oftentimes irony and satire within this book. And it certainly helps to know what is being satirized. But you can't expect the heroes in this story to be perfect. The focus on the spiritual quest is much more about the struggle of the quester than it is about the quester really being high and moral. The book seems to take for granted that nobody's perfect. In spite of the fact that some of these religious philosophies may not be perfectly familiar to you, I imagine that you'll still find that the value of a heroic and spiritual journey is one that you're very familiar with, reflecting the universality of human storytelling. No matter what culture or background we come from, we all value heroism. We all value spiritual journeys. We all value a quest to better ourselves. So keep that in mind as you're reading this book. Chapters 1 through 7 are the same in the original and in Arthur Whaley's, and they tell the origin story of Sung Kong the Monkey King. I'm going to just briefly summarize all seven chapters just to get you started, but I recommend you delve deeper. The book opens with a rock that has been blown upon by the winds of heaven. The rock becomes an egg and cracks open and out hops a stone monkey. He plays around a bit and then he joins a band of other monkeys. As they jump and eat fruit and play, they come to a waterfall. And all the monkeys wonder what's on the other side of the waterfall. None of them are very brave, but they say if one of us were brave enough to leap through the waterfall and see what's on the other side, we would make that monkey our king. And so the stone monkey decides that he wants to do that, and he runs and he jumps over through the waterfall and finds a beautiful cave. The cave is basically set up like this beautiful monkey resort, a perfect home for all of the monkeys. 
And so he jumps back out, and he tells all the monkeys, and they all follow him into the cave. He reminds them of their promise, and changes his name to Handsome Monkey King. There's a lot of name changing in this book, by the way. It's a cultural thing. Things go well for a while, until one day, at dinner, the Monkey King suddenly begins to cry. He's thinking of his own mortality, and how all this has to end someday, he has to die. And so his monkeys say, oh, well, you found religion, so you need to, to go find someone who can teach you about immortality, where you can live forever. And so the Monkey King leaves all of his subjects, and he gets on a boat, and he sails across the ocean. And he travels, and he travels, and he finally stumbles across this Taoist teacher, Sabodhi. And with a little bit of coercing and wheedling, he works his way in as a pupil of Sabodhi. And because he's very clever and able to read secret signs, he finally gets private tutoring with the patriarch Sabodhi. And not only does he learn the path to immortality, but he also learns a whole lot of other magic powers, like the 72 transformations. Poof! <laughs> it's a narwhal. And he learns how to cloud soar where he can fly super far. But eventually, because he shows off to the other pupils, Sabodhi kicks him out. And so he returns home to his monkeys. But he finds that things are not all well at home. The Demon King of Havoc has taken over and imprisoned all of his monkeys. But now Monkey is super powerful and magical, and so he goes and beats up the Demon King of Magic and takes his huge awesome sword. He then decides to train all of his monkeys in martial arts so that they can better defend themselves. He also beats up a whole bunch of other demons and ogres and forces them to become sort of a bodyguard for the monkeys. And so he goes and steals a whole bunch of weapons from civilization and gives them to the monkeys and trains them all up. But he can't find a weapon that's really cool enough for himself. I mean, he has the, the Demon of Havoc sword, but it's just not, not enough. And so he goes to the oceans, where the Dragon Kings live. And there he demands super awesome armor and weapon from the Dragon King. They give him his Wishing Staff, or the Golden Ringed Cudgel. This famous weapon weighs so much that no one else can pick it up. It also can change size to any size that Monkey wishes it to. And so when he's not using it, he shrinks it down really tiny and tucks it behind his ear. He also gets a super cool new outfit with the phoenix feather cap and the cloud hopping shoes and the cool golden armor. And he looks pretty cool. Shortly thereafter, the king of the dead, Yama, sends his guards to take Monkey because it's time for him to die. But he got out of that whole death thing. And so when they take him down to the underworld, he wrecks the place, tears up all the records, and erases all of the monkey's death dates so monkeys never die anymore, and leaves the place trashed. I mean, the underworld, the land of the dead, Yama, king of the dead, sounds really ominous, but the place is basically like a big office with a bunch of filing cabinets. Yama and the Dragon Kings have complained to the Jade Emperor, the king of Taoist heaven. He needs to do something about monkey. But as we'll see with the satire here, the way heaven works, it's, it's a really thick, bureaucracy. Just like the Land of the Dead is a filing records room, Wu Chang'en portrays Heaven as a bunch of bureaucratic officials who are completely bound up in red tape and can't get anything done. They debate back and forth what they should do about this rampaging Monkey King and decide they better give him a job to keep him out of trouble. And so they call him up to Heaven and they give him charge over the Heavenly Stables. It's not a real position, they make it up just for him, but they act like it's a real position. And he's rather happily taking care of the horses up in heaven for a while, until he's told that it's not a real job. And he's so insulted that he returns home to his monkeys. Now, that they, now they see that they haven't solved the problem with the Monkey King, and so they decide that they better do something about it. Monkey, meanwhile, has changed his name again, and he's decided to call himself Great Sage, equal to heaven. Oh, I forgot he changed his name to Aware of Vacuity when he was a student of Sabotis. And all the heavenly officials still don't know what to do with him, and so finally they just decide to go ahead and give him the title Great Sage Equal to Heaven, and promote him up and give him a real job. So they put him in charge of the Peach Orchard. It's a little bit dangerous considering how much Monkey likes fruit. The Peach Orchard is full of wonderful peaches, these magical peaches that take forever to ripen. There are three different kinds of trees, and each kind takes longer to ripen and gives an even better blessing when you eat it. Monkey eats all the fruit. And then when the Empress throws her peach banquet and sends her fairy servants to collect the peaches, there are none. And Monkey, realizing he's not yet been invited to the peach banquet, decides to play some pranks. He freezes the fairy servants, and then he goes to where the peach ba banquet is being prepared, and he eats up all the food, and he messes up everything, drinks up all the palm wine, 
When he realizes his mistake, that he's going to get in big trouble for this, he runs away and hides in Lao Tzu's house. Now Lao Tzu is the founder of Taoism, and he has this elixir of immortality there. Well, Monkey drinks all of that, too, and eats up all the pills of immortality. And then, realizing that he's made an even bigger mistake and now he's going to be in bigger trouble, he runs away home. Everyone in heaven is absolutely outraged, and they all decide that finally this is too much, they need to go do something about this monkey. And so they draw up their big heavenly armies and they all march down there, and Monkey has these huge wonderful fight scenes with all of these different deities, most famously with a powerful Erlang. And in the middle of that battle with Erlang, the tide changes because Monkey sees some of his monkeys are being captured, and it causes him to lose his spirit even though he doesn't seem to be losing the fight. And so he begins to run, and there's this transformation chase scene where Monkey keeps turning into other things and Erlang turns into other things as he pursues him. Finally, the tide is turned when the Taoists get a little bit of help from the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin, who's going to be a very important character as this book goes forward. And then Lao Tzu joins in with his diamond snare, and together they all manage to capture Monkey. Now they need to know what to do to punish him. Well, they try to execute him over and over again, and it's completely ineffective because he's basically consumed every magical immortal peach and all of the immortal elixir, and yeah, he's immortal like a thousand times over now. And Lao Tzu tries to cook him in the crucible, which only makes his eyes glow red gold. Monkey finally gets away and is about to cause all kinds of other trouble. When the Taoists, who have been really helpless this whole time, turn to Buddha, who just happens to be in for a visit. And so Buddha decides to challenge Monkey. Monkey says, at this point, I want the Jade Emperor spot. I want to be the King of Heaven now. Notice how his ambition has grown throughout this process. And Buddha says, fine, if you can beat me in this one match, you can be the Jade Emperor. And so Buddha holds out his hand and says, Monkey, if you can jump over my hand, then you can be the next Jade Emperor. And so Monkey jumps! And he flies and flies and flies and flies and flies farther than he's ever flown before. And finally, at the end of everything, he comes to these five huge pillars. And he says, ha, look, I've come beyond the reaches of everything. I flew over Buddha's hand and I flew a bazillion miles away. Look at me. And because he's rather cocky, he signs his name on one of the pillars. And then he urinates on it, marking his territory. And then he jumps up and flies back. And landing back on Buddha's palm, he says, Look, I flew to the end of everything. I found these five pillars. I totally beat you, Buddha. And then Buddha's like, Look at my hand. Bum, bum, bum! And on his hand is Monkey's name and a little bit of urine. Because those five pillars were actually Buddha's fingers. You can't get out of the palm of Buddha. And then Buddha turns his hand over. And Monkey gets buried under Buddha's fingers, which transform into a mountain, the Mountain of Five Fingers, holding him trapped for 400 years. Actually, five minutes later, he's almost wiggled out, but then Buddha puts a seal that keeps him from doing Kung Fu on the mountain, and he's trapped there for 400 years until he finally learns his lesson. Will he learn his lesson? Well, that's what the rest of the book is about. Thanks for watching! You can click to subscribe or to watch another video, and I will see you next time! Bye-bye!